Um, it's nice to speak again because I think last time um, I interviewed you for Made in Italy, uh, it was about yeah. one of the four minute junket slots. So it's nice to um, be able to talk for a bit longer today. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Those four minute things are impossible. I know. They're so, I mean, they're hard enough in real life, never mind on Zoom. It's kind of yeah, it's crazy. Um, but I'm going to begin by asking about how kind of weird it is talking about a movie that you made some time ago. I mean, is that quite, this must be quite a unique thing for you, I guess, because I guess traditionally when you do interviews, it's for projects that at best are kind of two, two years old. But this is going back a while, this one. Yeah, I mean, the only other time I've done it is uh, there was an anniversary of Master and Commander and I did a few interviews for that. But that's because the film had such great longevity that that you know, people were still interested in it. This is a sort of different beast in that, um, it, I mean, I, honestly, I don't know the answer to this, Stefan, but it feels like it got a sort of limited release somehow, because I'm sure I have, I did think it had come out. But it, from talking to the director, it sounds like it's generated enough interest that it's been picked up for a slightly wider release now, which is, you know, great. I'm really happy for the film. Yeah. Did you have to, like, before doing the interviews uh, today, did you have to rewatch it to kind of go back and remember it? Or was it some, or, or, wait, or those experiences as an actor, just things that kind of live long in the memory, those kind of small details and stuff? Well, I didn't have to rewatch it because I didn't watch it the first time. <laughs> um, I, but, but that's not anything to do with this film. I don't, I don't watch the things that I'm in uh, unless I am, you know, in a, in a premiere and really have no escape route. Uh, only because I don't see what other people see, you know. I see the fear in my eye and then I'm disappointed because when I read the script I hoped it would be like this and I wasn't really very good at doing that and other people don't see any of that stuff. So for me, you know, in terms of being an actor, the preparation and the doing of it is the crucial part of my job. I don't I don't think it particularly helps the process to watch it. Also, I always have the same experience, which is I think I look like Brad Pitt. And then, you know, the, the film starts and you realise you don't. And it's like, it's like a brand new realisation every single time. Uh, you know, I, 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 the film starts and I'm excited. And then I see me and I'm like, oh, no, oh, no, no, no. I even get that with my voice when I'm transcribing. I'm always, I always feel, I like, feel like a lot of people have that experience with, you know, when they listen to their, their voicemail or when we used to listen to the voicemail back or whatever. Uh, I guess now people are much more accustomed to putting themselves on camera and seeing themselves on camera and all the rest of it. But yeah, there's anyway, for all those reasons, I haven't ever seen the film. I can remember enough of it that we can have a conversation about it. <laughs> yeah, because no, I, yeah, I, was, I, was, I was more of asking that because I was interested about whether you do watch your own stuff. But I was wondering, you know, obviously, like you said, it can be hard to have that um, ability to, to have a disconnect and watch something you're in and maybe you get kind of as, as emotionally involved as I would as an audience member. But were you able to, have you been able to, to do that for Made in Italy as, as, as something you've directed? Or, or do you still see yourself and your direction within, within the, 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 the movie? Um, I think it's still a little bit too close. I mean, I was really, really, you know, it made in Italy is sort of the only thing I thought about for 18 months. Um, so I think it, it probably not quite enough time has elapsed. I do remember going to a screening of, of again, Master and Commander about five or six years after it had come out. They did a screening in, in LA. And I remember, and I, I maybe had seen the film once or twice before when it first came out. And then I watched it again six years later. And I remember thinking, oh, I feel like I'm watching this film properly now. Because when I watched it the other times, which was very in very quick succession, I think I saw, a, 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 I saw it in America and I saw it in London about five days later, and then I didn't see it for six years. But both of those experiences for me were, oh, I remember that day. That was the day when this, that, and the other happened. And oh yeah, and so-and-so was, you know, did that and offset and all the rest of it. And oh, right, that's what that helicopter shot looks like. And, you know, I couldn't in any way dissociate from the experience of doing it. I couldn't watch the film. I had a very different experience. And six years later, I feel like I actually watched the film. I was able to, you know, it didn't bother me that it was me that was that I was seeing occasionally on screen. 
I just was able to watch the film. And so, you know, by that sort of uh, uh, yardstick, I guess I need about four more years and then I can watch Made in Italy and <laughs> with yeah. some, some objectivity. <laughs> Uh, so the, the character in The Philosophers, um, Mr. Zimmet, is it's a great role. You must have it must it must be one of those ones that sort of leapt off the page when you got that screenplay because there's so many there's so many kind of uh, undertones and kind of nuances to him and this sort of darker elements as well to his kind of psyche. I, it just uh, for, as an actor, this made a great character to to get your teeth stuck into, I guess. I mean, I really really loved the fact that he was so um, you know complex, but there are so many question marks about about him. Uh, and the you know this he does something halfway through the first thought experiment which i remember reading and going oh wow i did not see that coming um and and that was probably the moment i was like well i've i've got to play this character i got to play this guy um it didn't hurt. it didn't hurt at all that when they sent me the script they also sent me a lookbook for the locations that we were going to go and film at and I, I sort of obviously because I'm a child I looked at the pictures first so I, I, I opened up this lookbook and there was Prambanam which is you know should be in a, an Indiana Jones movie and then there's the side of a volcano which should be in a James Bond movie and then there's a deserted island which also should be in a James Bond movie and I, I, I looked at those three locations and thought I mean this script's going to have to be pretty bad for me not to want to, <laughs> want to go to these places, you know. Um, and then I was really thrilled because the character was as interesting as the locations. Yeah, because yeah, I, I mean, they, they, it, there's a lot of interesting aspects to this in the sense that it's a very, as the sort of title alludes to, it's a very philosoph philosophical movie. There's lots of interesting questions and hypothetical kind of scenarios that play well, out. Well, I really admired it for, for that, for being unashamedly intellectual you know it's a sort of it's a, obviously it's a very low budget film but it's got a bunch of young kids in it and so you would have thought that based on experience that that film would be relatively lowest common denominator stuff and actually I thought it was it was challenging I mean I used to laugh with the director that he was making a tiny 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 budget uh Christopher Nolan film because Chris is like the only other director who's made, not the only other director, but he's obviously the most famous director doing this. He's making really intellectually challenging films. Now he also has the budget to back it up with some very exciting visual set pieces. And I, I, I hoped that what we were doing inexpensively is sort of along the same lines. Yeah, no, I think the ambition was of, of it can sort of comes through so much. But, but, but did it make you, when you are dealing with a kind of character or a screenplay that does pose these questions and it makes an audience member kind of think about the world differently for that 90 minutes they're in there, is that the case for, for yourself as an actor? And is that, does that ever happen from a character? Do you ever find you play a role or play in a movie where the themes and the kind of topics discussed and, and all the thoughts your character has to think within the film um, kind of have a, a lasting impact on you as, as a person? Ooh. I mean, I think I do remember, uh, I don't even say hot water over this, but I remember years ago, my, well, like my first leading role was in a TV series called Rebel Heart. And it was about a young middle-class Irish boy who took part in the Easter Rising um, in Dublin and then goes on to become part of the formation of what is what we would now call the IRA. And I'm not saying that I in any way endorse killing of other people at all, but there was a lot that I didn't understand uh, about that time in Irish history. So I think doing the research around that project was a little bit eye-opening because I, I guess I only had one side of the story not one side of the story that's 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 ridiculous the, you know I knew what the newspapers reported which is that innocent people died and that's horrific um I, I didn't quite understand the history of Ireland so you know that was an interesting thing to to learn about um it's always good when you're playing roles and you have an opportunity to find out a bit more than you 
than you than you knew you know one of the things that i love about the movies is it's sort of stealth education uh, if you're lucky you know i mean nolan is a brilliant example of somebody who taught us all about quantum physics in a film that was a big space movie really you know yeah, but but yeah, because I mean, there's something we sort of take for granted, isn't it? But it must be what's such a great aspect of your job is not is the learning side, not because every time you play in a period piece, your job is to then learn about the period you're in, but also the kind of life skills. I even thought about, I mean, actors have done courses on how to yield a kind of wield a sorry a big sword while on a horse. I mean, people like me don't get to do that, <laughs> so that must be a kind of nice aspect. There is a real educational side, isn't there, from from what you do? Oh, definitely learning the skills and all that kind of stuff is is really, really entertaining, really fun. And and actually it feels so odd because you're inevitably doing it, you know, in your own clothes and what have you, and it all feels very peculiar. And then, and then suddenly you're on a film set with a wig and a costume and surrounded by people who are doing the same thing. And, you know, there are moments when you feel quite absorbed into all of that. I, my favorite one actually was I did a, I did a project, um, with Brendan Gleeson playing Churchill and I played his private secretary and there was a moment where he was in a room delivering one of Churchill's speeches from the Second World War and I was standing there watching and as he delivered it I, I it's maybe it's probably the only time I really got major shivers down my spine because it actually felt sort of if you squinted yeah. <laughs> like I was like I was in a room watching Churchill deliver one of those speeches. And, you know, those moments are very, very exciting. Yeah, and a testament to a great actor as well. That he oh, was. he was brilliant. <laughs> he is brilliant, but he was so good in that. He was so good as Churchill. And I remember somebody saying, oh, Brendan Gleeson's playing Churchill. And I thought, really? Okay. And then I saw him and it, I mean, it's, he's just mesmeric. And I was wondering too, because obviously in The Philosophers, you play a teacher and following on almost from that Brendan Gleeson sort of question, I just wonder if there's ever been a kind of uh, a teacher from your life, be it, it could be a teacher from school or it could just be an actor or someone that, or director that took you under your wing when you first, under their wing, when you first got in the industry. But do you have a kind of someone that comes to mind as someone who really helped guide you kind of into what you do? Oh too? yeah, no, there were, there, there, there's been a couple of people. When I was at, when I was at secondary school, there was a, a teacher called Duncan Noel Payne. Mr. Noel Payton. And he was a real larger than life character and he ran the drama department. And I didn't know that I was interested in, in drama at all. But they were doing, the school play was Bugsy Malone. And I loved that film. And I really wanted to use a splurge gun. And uh, so, so the sort of warm up for the audition was that I think we all had to improvise for a period, I forget how, I mean, in my head, it's two hours, it was probably 15 minutes. You had to improvise that you were a down and out in Chicago or something like that. And I'm, I was 11, I knew nothing about, I didn't even know where Chicago was. I didn't know very much about being a down and out. And uh, so we did this improvisation and I remember at the end of it, he said to me, that was, that was really good. That was really good. And, I, and the way he said it to me, I don't know if any teacher had ever said anything that made me feel so good before. Uh, you know, he genuinely then took an interest in what happened next. And actually, uh, you know, I don't know if I would be an actor if it weren't for him. Did you he keep was, in touch at all? I know it's hard, it's easier said than done, isn't it? With sort of What was the question, sorry? If you kept in touch or, or if, you ever, if you ever sort of let him know this. because be I did, I wrote him a letter. I wrote him a letter in my 30s, uh, which of course I am still in. Uh, <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote him a letter to say thank you um, because it was, a, it was a really big turning point in my life. And, um, you know, I, 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 from, it's really difficult to trace it all back, but from that moment onwards, I remember, you know, I liked playing cricket, I liked playing tennis, and I, I, I sort of enjoyed some of the work that we did at school but I really loved it when I got to go to the theatre I really really loved it and you know and I remember my sister uh used to get this magazine called Smash Hits uh which I'd always steal and read and there was a problem page at the back which is always hilarious apart from this one girl who'd written in saying dear 
aunt, whatever. I want to be an actress. What do I do? How do I do that? And the thing had said, you need to write to the Central School of Speech and Drama and get their perspectives and apply when you're 17. And I was 13 at that time. And I secretly wrote a letter to the Central School of Speech and Drama and got their prospectus. And it, it just, it sat in my drawer, like the Ark of the Lost Covenant. I'd get it out every night and look at these pictures of these actors at drama school and think, God, I don't know, it seems like a pipe dream. And then, you know, actually, uh, I went to Central and auditioned and didn't get in, which was not part of the plan particularly. And I re-auditioned the next year and, and I did get in the second year, but I'd also got into Lambda. And by then I decided I wanted to go to Lambda because they hadn't rejected me once. But it, it's from those sort of small moments. I now look back on it and I think, wow, that, well, it, that's, that letter, in, crazy silly letter in Smash Hits sort of changed the course of my life because I ended up getting that prospectus and keeping it for four years. Because I was going to say too, because I'm I'm in my thirties too, and uh, I've got to that age. Where I've realised that some of those teachers that when I was ten or eleven and looked up to and admired are probably about the same age I am now. And I just wondered if that's something that you've kind of started to take us as, as in what you do. Is, is there a responsibility that comes with getting older and more experience in this industry? And do you ever find that when you're working with younger co-stars and well, in the philosophers, obviously you were the oldest kind of cast member. Do you find sometimes that sort of responsibility to help them at all? Or is, you know, was that not I something? I, um, I, I think unsolicited advice is probably not terribly helpful. I, I never wanted any, but actually, when I when I was a young actor, I was always asking the older actors because I love all the stories. I love the stories, you know, when they all the actors all had stories about being in Weekly Rep and all the rest of it. I loved all of that. Uh, so I was kind of constantly in the bar in the evenings, I'm desperate to hear more. Um, and it's a different world we live in now. You know that that even when I was starting the idea that you would leave drama school and then you could be in an american tv show immediately was preposterous the the, the idea was always you sort of paid paid your dues in the theater and then after a certain time you maybe did a sort of small independent movie and sent a little rocket across the ocean and then if you know if they if they liked it they might invite you to be in something else that was always sort of how it worked and then we live in a really different world now you know people do one TV show and they're insanely famous immediately. Um, and, you know, okay, so Leonardo DiCaprio handled that very, very well and lots of other people find it much harder. Um, I suppose what I'm saying is quite often I think, well, if, people, if people ask for any suggestions, then great. You know, but we're all in it together. And I feel like the younger generation know a lot more than I did at the age of 20. By the way, when I was when I was starting out, when I was younger, being in shape was not part of the job description of being an actor. I mean, going to the gym was absolutely an optional extra. And now it is part of the curriculum. Like you just have to look like a superhero, I think, if you're 20. <laughs> Yeah, but you're right about the stories. It's when you it's when you realise because I've done a few kind of set visits or behind the scenes, you know, EPK stuff or whatever. And sometimes I found myself at the the end of the day having a drink or at the bar. And you, it's it's when they say things like, oh, "I was um, chatting," to, was, I was on this one set with Lawrence Olivier, and you just go, "Yeah," and you just have to keep this straight face of like, "Yeah, that's a completely normal way to start a sentence." They are the best best stories. But I was going to say with uh, the philosophers, because obviously, you know, it was, like, as we mentioned, it was a kind of a, a few years back. I just wondered if you keep in touch with people just sort of from in front of the screen or behind the screen. And just as a, does that happen often? I think obviously as an audience member, we have this romantic idea that when a project's done, there's all these kind of uh, people, you know, there's, you know, you all meet up and reunite and have WhatsApp groups and kind of constantly stay in touch and do things. But I guess life does go on, doesn't it? But I just wondered if- I if think that does. I mean, I remember when I, the first job I ever did, which was an episode of DL and Pasco. I knew everyone. I knew all the crew. I knew all the actors, the people who I wasn't in scenes with. I knew everyone. We were all best friends and we did stay in touch for a while. And I assumed, like you, that we that would be how it would go on. But actually, it sort of isn't how it goes on. You stay in touch with a, a select few in the end. Um, 
I, uh, I stay in touch a bit with the director. I stay in touch with one of the producers. Uh, and, and then one of the actors is a fairly good friend of mine. Um, but he's not one of the main roles in the, in the film. Uh, he's a brilliant, he's a brilliant actor, but he's a brilliant musician called Toby Sebastian who, you know, we got on really well when we were shooting the film and we stayed in touch and all the rest of it. And anyway, years and years and years later, we were having lunch and he was talking about blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah, my sister's done a film, blah, blah, blah. Seems like it's quite, going quite well for her. And uh, his, <laughs> I didn't realize he changed his last name from Pew to Sebastian. And oh, his right. sister was, was Florence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's doing okay for herself at the moment. She's doing okay for herself, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. So uh, Toby is really the one that I stay in touch with uh, the, the most out of all of that. But you can never, you can never tell, you know. Some jobs you end up with three or four friends and, and some jobs they're just lovely jobs. And some jobs are just jobs. Yeah. And uh, my, I, my sort of final question really, because I've got to head off and do another interview after this one. But I was just wondering about um, sort of looking back now, when you, you sort of look, uh, looking back at over old projects and looking forward at new projects, if your perspective has changed as an actor, having been a director, maybe on what characters you might want to play and just on, on filmmaking as a kind of craft, do you think that now you've been behind and sat in the director's seat that your, your whole perspective on the industry has, has changed somewhat? No, I wouldn't say my whole perspective on the industry has changed. I, I think I probably have a, a far greater understanding of how the sausages are made, particularly in the independent film world. Um, I think if I sort of look back on the early part of my career, although I'd already sort of stopped worrying about this too much, I, I, I think I've always felt that an actor was supposed to come with really strong defined ideas and this is how we should do it. And, and actually I, I, I dismissed that as a way of being a film actor anyway, perhaps in the theater it works differently, but on film, it's so much a director's medium that honestly for me now, the, the best way forward is just to try anything. You know, if the director says, why don't you try this completely opposite to how you had it in mind? My answer is, okay, sure. Yeah, and, and, and I think that had already started to change before I directed, but now I now I have directed. It makes perfect sense. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to be too um, uh, determined about what you're going to do. I guess. Yeah. So just very quickly, actually, before I do, I was going to ask one last thing. But is, is if what you've got coming up, if, do you reckon you could direct again? Is that the idea to 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 sit? To I would really like to direct again if I if I come up with the right project. Um, and, and, and I have a couple of thoughts of things that I'd like to do. Uh, so yeah, I, I would really like to do it again. Um, but also I love being an actor. So it's kind of the best of both worlds at the minute. Yeah, good. Well, it's nice to, uh, well, I'll be looking forward to seeing you do either because it's always a pleasure. But uh, thank you for speaking to me today because yeah, it's nice to do a, a longer interview than the last one. Yeah, sure. yeah. Cheers, um, Stefan. Yeah, thanks so much, James. And best of luck. I was going to say best of luck with the, the release. I mean, it was obviously a while ago, but it still came out this week, didn't it? So, uh, so yeah. I hope people go watch it. I hope people get something out of it. I really enjoyed it. I just spent, spent the whole night just like all these kind of equations and things working, rolling around my head. So I'm... <laughs> that's great. If the film's made you do that, then that's, that seems to me like a perfect sort of uh, response, actually. Exactly. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, James, and I'll speak to you soon, hopefully. Cheers, Stefan. Take yeah. care. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, Is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey!